This piece of technology here is pretty much like Intel's third most important piece of technology that they've ever produced in desktop after Pentium and the release of their Core i series. This really is the culmination of probably three years worth of work to really create a new era in high-end computing. morning welcome to turbo tortoise tech this is totally not the hardest review i've ever had to do i've done the intro now at least seven times and i just i can't move forward on it because the elephant in the room is this is like like i said the third probably the third most important like piece of technology in desktop processing to date to date first it was pentium okay and they had actually had that was that was a really bad time it was a uh, whole whole sections of like of like law around patenting were developed at that time because you couldn't patent a number and that's why Pentium actually even existed, which is one. And then two was the, the release of their core series. And that started off in 2008, 2007 with Core 2 Duo and then Core 2 Duo and then Core 2 Quad. And that eventually became what we know as the Core i series and the i7 launch, etc. And the rest, as they say, is history. And now 12 generations later, we have these things, which conceptually and technology wise are groundbreaking because they are combining different cores of different processes onto the chip. And then they have a very advanced scheduler in the works there as well. And thankfully, Asus has given me an absolutely monstrous PC to test all of this in, which is very good because the tests that I'm going to be putting them up against were done with the best chipset and pretty much the best RAM that you could get for those platforms at the time. So what have we got pumping away inside of the PC over here? Let's start off with the elephant in the room, the water-cooled 6900 XT OC. This thing is an absolute savage and it barely cracked 65 degrees under full load. The motherboard also being a ROG Z690F, one of their much higher level chipsets. The ROG Strix is really are just underneath the Maximus, but this board is like 10,000 Rand for this new one. Then the RAM, they've got two of the 16 gig HyperX DIMMs from Kingston in dual channel, well, actually in quad channel at 4,800 megahertz. One of the interesting upgrades with DDR5 is even though it, it is physically connected in a dual channel setup, it actually runs with a quad channel memory setup. Cooling for the CPU comes in the way of the ROG Strix 240 millimeter LC. And then all of this is being powered by their 1000 watt ROG, ROG Strix power supply. For storage, we threw in Corsair's MP600 XT, one that I recently reviewed, one of the best Gen 4 PCIe NVMEs to make sure that there's no bottlenecks there. And then all of that is wrapped up in the EVTEC icon, which I have also reviewed. So if you do want to see that, it is available on the channel. But this is actually quite a capable PC case. And I want you guys to know that I have not touched a single cable in this. It was built by the EVTEC guys, and this is how it was delivered to me. So if you're wondering if they can do a 60,000 Rand high end build and do it properly, well, there you go. Now I've tested everything and i mean everything and in like real world tests and stuff i'm going to include stuff towards the end of the video for AAA games testing with actual benchmarking that i was doing while i was doing the recording stuff as well so you can see what it would be like if you were you know capping games or or doing live recording of your gameplay and then i am going to be doing a stream later where i hope to stream two hours of need for speed heat off of the machine through the default software or, or default settings on OBS, just using the fast preset to see what that produces to stream like. I'm, I'm basically trying to just check every single box that I didn't see through other reviews. And I'm very glad that I did because it's going to build onto that. And I got to play BF2042 at over 100 frames per second. Starting with Cinebench R20 and R23 with their newer instruction sets, those flew like a small dog that got into a case of Red Bull. The single core performance gains over previous gen are so violent, it's being investigated by the UN for war crimes. Now we move on to some other synthetics in the form of 3D Mark, and especially looking at those physics scores. That's where things get exceedingly interesting with the 16 core 24 thread, and Intel absolutely smashing the previous generation again. And even on the graphics scores, and this is with their worst GPU, mind you, the RTX 3090 
does run a little bit faster than the 6900 XT, especially in synthetics. So the fact that the 12900K beats out the two chips from Team Red with a technically worse GPU just shows you how fast this GPU is with single core performance like 1080p gaming. And, but even more so in games like 2K and 4K tests like Time Spy Extreme and like Fire Strike Extreme that's showing how much further even it goes in those environments. And that's sort of unusual. Most of the time, single core performance only really relates back to the actual like 1080p tests. It doesn't really scale into 2K and 4K as much. The rest of the gaming tests were more the same with the 12900K coming out on top. And like I said, with technically a worse GPU, the only place it really lost out was in RTX testing, but that's more down to this GPU than it is down to the actual CPU. That holds as the case example until we get to CSGO where the performance falls behind what I would get on inferior componentry. It's not only CSGO that's been affected, but Metro and Cinebench R15 as well. This is where the early adopters tax kind of comes in with technology of this. Inside of this chip is a very, very clever scheduler and it's busy assigning workloads to the performance cores or the efficiency cores. The efficiency cores have hyper-threading and are more for like, you know, rendering workloads and multi-threaded things like running Adobe or Cinebench tests, etc. But like you can see with Cinebench R15, it doesn't always work on legacy software. Games that are constantly updated and our AAA and new titles weren't really affected by this, especially where stability concerns were coming in, like you've seen with that Metro graph where it would just like tank or completely stop as it was busy moving between the cores, which is obviously not ideal. It feels kind of horrible, but it didn't happen in any of the new AAA games. The power draw from this chip is everything that's been reported on as well. It absolutely blew the doors off the 240mm radiator. When I was playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare with all the RTX and everything on, it looked incredible. It ran really, really well. I mean, 200 FPS in multiplayer with RTX on is nothing to turn your nose up at. But it was exceptionally loud because of that. And as soon as I closed the game, it dropped right, right back down to 45 degrees, which tells me the loop's thermal efficiency is not as much the issue as much as the heat that's coming off of that CPU. 240 mil rads are good for about 200 watts. So you are going to need a 360 millimeter radiator if you do want to get one of these. Does this all mean that the Intel's created something relevant here? Not by a long shot. It is a very cool idea conceptually and in practice it is working don't forget i mean there is a major ram boost over here that's happening which is giving way better bandwidth to the chip but obviously that's the advantage of this being the first ddr5 platform is intel gets to flex that improvement along with their own improvements on that chip as I said, I have done AAA gaming tests. I don't have reference point data for a lot of it because some of my testing is like really old and it's when that sort of stuff came out. So I don't really have anything to update there for you. But what I can say is my 3D Mark profile is completely open for your viewing. It's completely public. So if you look for Wiki Triple XL as one word, then you'll be able to find my user profile. And then you can go through my results and actually see what the clock rates and speeds were and the temperatures, etc. You'll be able to compare those results online. There's obviously not a lot of reference point data for the system. There's basically nothing. So yeah, you'll have to uh, take your own score and look at that and consider from there if it's going to be an upgrade for you as far as gaming and stuff goes. But if for the AAA games, what I've done, like I said, is I've recorded them while I've been, oh, we've had the instant replay function running through Radeon's command and control center, which is like way better than it used to be. It looks 10,000 times better. It's not an absolute blocky mess and feels quite nice to present that stuff to you as this is actually an option that works now at Radeon. So big plus to them for doing that. But I wanted to create a real world test as if I had the replay buffer, you know, going to RAM and using the CPU for the game, etc. as I would on my normal PC on an every day today environment is normally how I go about creating content. I constantly have that running in the background. So I set it up in the same way to be able to do that. 
One thing I will say to you is it didn't plug in for BF2042. It just couldn't get into the system. And I did also do the DX12 trick, which if you don't know about, was shown to me by my boy Undercover Scout. If you don't know about that trick, it literally will get you 30 FPS on like entry, more entry level systems. My 5900X in 2070 went from just getting on 100 FPS on low setting to going into the more 130s, even 140s. But like Doom, for instance, you can actually see the frame rate counter and temps and everything on the top right of that gameplay. So you can see exactly how it reacts to the environments and stuff that I'm in. This is with absolutely everything maxed out. RTX, the works has been put onto these games. So I'm showing you the total limits really of the technology. In conclusion then, yes, I've been very stressed. If you're wondering why I'm a little bit offbeat, it's just because I want to kind of be acknowledging of like, Intel's work here is very, very good. It is a lot better foot forward technology wise than what I'd seen, you know, in, even I would say in the last five years. I think it's, I think we're all in agreement. 14 NM was stretched really to its limits. And this is a real like competitive space thing. I do think the early adopters tax and pricing is quite on the extreme end. But if you've just got to have the best thing, again, if you just got to have the best thing, then this is the best. There is nothing better than this. It is very cool, very clever technology. And I'm really looking forward to seeing its development time because something that Intel got really good at was efficiency from their mobile environments where we've seen 25 watt chips absolutely thumping three-year-old 120 watt chips. So I think as this thing gets developed and as it goes through its product life cycle, it's going to be absolutely intense. Anyway, that is all I have for you in this review. If you have enjoyed it, please do hit us up with a like and subscribe and try not murder me in the comments. I appreciate you. I'm here to help. I'll, I'll see you in the comments. Oh wait, cheers. Have a good one. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>
inside that demonic citadel. I will mark her location on Numbers are falling. 